Okay, Al Capone does my shirts. Chapter 2, Errand Boy. Saturday, January 5th, 1935. I'm Mrs. James, by the way. All right. When I wake up, I feel kind of foolish having slept with my shoes on and my baseball bat under the covers with me. My mom's banging around in the tiny hall outside my room. I stick the bat under my bed. Where's dad? I ask. Right here, my dad answers from the living room. He's sitting on the floor with Natalie, holding a pile of buttons in each hand. Dad, could you show me the cell house and then maybe we could play ball? I sound like I'm six and a half now, but I can't help it. He's been gone forever and I hardly got to see him all yesterday. It's lonely in my family when he's not around. His smile seems to lose its pink. He puts Natalie's buttons down in two careful piles, gets up and brushes his uniform off. I follow him to the kitchen. You're not working today, are you? I'm having a devil of a time setting up extra circuits in the laundry. Yeah, but you worked last night. My mom squeezes by to run her hands under the tap. Your father has two jobs here, Moose, electrician and guard. Two, Natalie calls from the living room. Two jobs, two. Doesn't anyone in this family believe in private conversations? I could help you, I offer. He shakes his head. You're not allowed in there. Convict areas are off limits to you kids, he says. I'm not a kid, I'm taller than you are. Go ahead, rub it in, he laughs, but at least I don't have those big feet either. They're an affliction, those feet. He grabs my head and knocks on it. I haven't seen you for three whole months, I say. Two months, 22 days, 22 days, Natalie calls out. That's right, sweet pea, you tell him, my father calls back. I bet, I'll bet you took Natalie out this morning, didn't you? The question comes shooting out before I can stop it. Oh, for goodness sake, Moose. My mother looks up from where she's jammed in the corner scrubbing the ice box. You weren't even up. That isn't fair, I say, although I know better. Don't talk about me about fair, young man. Don't get me started on that one. My mother glares at me. I'm sorry, Moose, my father says. He reaches for his officer's hat and settles it on his head. There's nothing I'd like better than to spend the day with you. You know that. His eyes look at me then quick away. Wait, 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 you're, you're leaving now? I ask. He groans. Afraid so, but there'll be plenty of time to spend together. I promise, buddy, okay? He smiles, kisses my mom and Nat goodbye and heads for the door. I watch him walk by the front window, his head bobbing like his foot hurts. My mom glances at her watch. My goodness, it's that time already. Moose, I need you to watch Natalie while I take the boat to the city. I have to get groceries and arrange an ice delivery, my mother says. Ice? I asked. We can't afford an electric refrigerator. We got to keep this one, she taps the old ice box. They have a grocery downstairs though, right? Doesn't have much. Try to do some unpacking while I'm gone. 11, 12, and 13 are all your stuff. My mother points to the crates, each numbered by Natalie. She takes off her apron and puts on her coat, her gloves, and her hat. You're leaving now too, I ask. I'll be back as soon as I can. Take good care of her, okay? My mom grabs my arm and squeezes it. I know she's thinking about what happened on the train yesterday. I had gone to take a leak and when I came back, Nat was kicking and screaming. She pulled a curtain off the rod and sent her button box flying down the aisle. My mom had her arms around Nat, trying to keep her from hurting anyone. The conductor and the motorman were yelling. People were staring. One lady was taking pictures. My mom finally got her calmed down by sitting on her right in the middle of the train aisle. I don't know which was more embarrassing, Natalie's behavior or my mother's. Sometimes Nat's tantrums go on and on for days and nothing makes them stop. It's impossible to know what will set her off. She looks pretty peaceful now though. Sure, mom. I follow her to the door. I didn't really mean what I said about it not being fair that Natalie got to go out with dad this morning. I didn't, you know I didn't, mom. She sighs. All right, Moose, just keep your eye on Natalie, okay? I watch her leave. A haze rises from the bay like a wall of gray closing me off from everything. In the kitchen, I find a casserole dish I don't recognize. Thought you might enjoy some manicotti. Looking forward to meeting you. Be Trixel, the card says. The manicotti tastes like big, 
fat spaghetti with pizza inside. I'm going for fourths and maybe fifths when I hear the knock. Don't answer it, I yell to Natalie as I wade through the boxes to the front door. The last thing I want is to meet new kids when Natalie's around. New people don't understand about her, they just don't. Open up, a girl cries. It's a little kid, a short person anyway. That's all I can make out through the window. No, I call back, but too late. Natalie is already there. She has both hands on the knob and all her weight rocked back on her heels, trying to get the door open. Don't open it. I shove my weight against the door. Come on, you know you're gonna, the girl outside says. Oh great, I have a little Eleanor Roosevelt on the side of the door and Natalie the screamer on the other. What they say about females being the weaker sex is the biggest lie in the world. Amen. Um, it doesn't matter that I weigh more than both of them put together. I know what I'm beat. I let Natalie open the door. The girl outside has black curly hair that's flat on one side as if she slept on it. She's missing half of her teeth. The one she has seems either too large or too small for her mouth. How old are you? She demands. Twelve. No, you're not, she says, walking right in without bothering to ask. Why would I lie about how old I am? She bites her lip like she's thinking about this. You got a big neck. You're supposed to get a long nose if you lie, not a big neck. No, she shakes her head as if she's absolutely certain I'm wrong. And you're what, seven? Seven and one quarter. Hello, Natalie. The girl smiles at her big tooth, smiles her big tooth, little tooth gap tooth smile. Your dad told me all about her, she whispers. We both look at Natalie. Her hair is like mine, brown and blonde, all mixed up like birdseed. Different eyes though. Mine are brown, hers are green, like the marbles nobody care, likes to trade away. But the way she holds her mouth too open and her shoulders uneven and one hand clamps down, the other people know, they always know. How old is she? The girl whispers. 10, I answer. Natalie's age is always 10. Every year my mom has a party for her and she turns 10 again. My mom started counting Nat's age the screwy way a long time ago. It was just easier to have her younger than me. Then my mother could be happy for each new thing I did without being another, being another thing that Natalie couldn't do. What's your name anyway? I ask. Teresa Manhattan. I'm supposed to show you around. You haven't seen anything yet, have you? You just got here last night. Natalie, come on, we're going now. Run to your coat, Teresa orders. I'm big as a linebacker and a seven-year-old girl treats me like her errand boy. Does she smell weakness on me? Still, I wanna get a look at this weird little island and. What do I care about what a bunch of criminals think anyway? I scribble a note to my mom until we've gone out and propped the paper between the ketchup and the cod liver oil. Come on, Nat. It's not everybody who gets to live down the street from thieves and murderers, you know.